Would you stand as we worship together?
seated as we watch this video honoring mothers. Let me start by saying I believe mothers should be respected. Love, honored, and cherished, most certainly they should be protected. Webster tells us that a mother is a female parent, one who gives birth. But for those of us with a good mom, we know of her even greater worth. She was the one who was always there, knowing just the right time to say yes. Though hated then, we see now that even her nose were meant for our best. In times of hurt, her words captivated our hearts, working what some would call her mommy magic. We see now that it was just grace and love as she helped us through times so tragic. But before we get swept away in a world of fairy tales and myths, we give pause realizing that Mother's Day for all is not a day of joy and bliss. For some people, the thought of Mother's Day causes them to mourn, for this day is one of great pain and suffering, a day where their heart is torn. Divorced, abused, abandoned, words that have left many moms feeling alone as they never settled into their role, trying instead to protect the children in their home. And what about the pain endured by those who could never have a baby, leading them to believe that God's love is at best a maybe. For all you young ladies who long for the great treasure of a new birth, may I speak life into your heart. It is your heart, not your womb, that is the measure of your true worth. The emptiness you feel right now because there is no life within your womb can only be filled by the gospel, not a child, a job, or even a faithful, loving groom. And others of you may be struggling from the fact that you bought the world's distortion. The pain you feel today is rooted in yesterday's abortion. Before we go any further, allow me to speak life where death may reign. Jesus' blood is sufficient to cleanse even the darkest sin stain and to heal the deepest soul's pain. Draw from your past, but don't live there, for to do so will turn your heart to stone. But look to the love of Jesus, a love that on an old rugged cross for the world was shown. On that cross, Jesus commissioned his earthly mom with a very exciting task, one that would change her world and another's. What was it, you ask? Behold, your son, Mary, he spoke concerning the disciple for whom he had a special love, an adoption at a funeral, something so beautiful it could have only been written from above. For all the moms who gained the status not in a hospital, but rather in a court of law, we praise God that through adoption, you too answered the motherhood call. And finally, for those whose moms are no longer on this earth and sod, we pray that today we'll find you cherishing the moments and mothers given to you by God. Moms, we stand in your honor today. We thank you for all that you've done. May you continue to mom well until you can no longer see the sun. S-U-N, you know the ball of fire that hangs in the sky. May the S-O-N reignite your passion. May you pass it on before you die. May all the hurts and the joys and the pains of your story simply just not be wasted. But may they from your memory be cut and on your children's heart be pasted. Happy Mother's Day, moms. We truly value all your tendencies and yes, even your little quirks. But most of all, we thank you for modeling for us the truth that love truly works. Romans 8 verse 38 says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou for 
you, Lord, for your faithfulness. You are faithful in every season, in every season, God. Amen. Church, would you stand with us as we continue to worship this morning?
Jesus, today we just give you praise and honor in this place because you are, in fact, that good shepherd that we can trust, that we can hold fast to, that we can know and follow. We don't sing these words out of obligation. We sing these words because you're a real Savior who offers a real relationship to each of us. And I know that there are some in this room who have experienced that faithfulness. And for that today, God, we just, we honor you. We give you praise. We sing out today because you are worthy, not only for what you've done for us, but just because of who you are, God. You are holy and set apart, and yet you have come close to be our shepherd. In Jesus, we have hope that is everlasting, and that is why we worship. So God, we just give the rest of today to you, the rest of this week. We ask that this moment we've had today is just starting in song. And as we dive in your word, that we would carry this after we leave this place. God, we just want to honor you with our lives. Thank you so much for who you are and what you've done for us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. You'll take your Bibles and open them to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. And I know what you're saying right off the bat. It's not Christmas. Well, it is like Christmas. It's Mother's Day. And um, when you stop and ponder the big events that, that are around church life and church calendar, uh, obviously Christmas is number one, Easter number two, and Mother's Day is number three. So out of all the attended events at our church, Mother's Day is in the top three. Why? Because we have this deal with moms. We know that uh, mothers make a difference in our life. Mothers matter. And today we're going to take some time and we're going to look at how and why that our mothers truly matter. There are several pictures I want you to look at today. Um, Number one, I want you to see the picture of uh, me and my mom. And if you look well at that picture, you'll notice that uh, I have on the same tie. <laughs> I was throwing away stuff at, to Goodwill the other day or giving it away, and I pulled that tie to throw it away, and for whatever reason, I decided I'd keep it. I got that tie in Itaewon in South Korea. I had gotten back from South Korea, and it was uh, Mother's Day, and Mom came to church with me. She drove over to surprise me on Mother's Day. I had on that tie, and I, I looked up at that picture when I saw it, when I'd already, and I remembered I still had that tie somewhere, so I found it, and I drug it out. That is the only thing I have from that picture that will fit me at this present moment, is this tie. <laughs> That jacket, pants, shirt, and all of that I've outgrown, but I still have the time. You know, Mother's Day has always been, especially as a Christian, has always been a special day in my life. Um, nobody knows what a mother goes through in raising of kids. I have a, the next picture there is my mom. Um, my mom is, a, a, she's a widow at this moment. There's five of us children. Um, my sister Robin, which is uh, right above my mom to the left. Uh, her daughter Candy's in the back back here. She's visiting from Mississippi today. And granddaughter Chelsea's right up front. But uh, Robin, out of the five kids, was the very best sibling. She was as close to perfect as I can imagine. Now, the, all the rest of us, the other four should have been drowned, but we wouldn't. Um, mom tolerated us. Uh, but here, mom is 45 years of age, a widow woman. And, and here we are, five kids. 
And I think back, uh, uh, growing up as a, as a one of five children to a mom who just happened to be married to an alcoholic. I mean, I'm not talking about, my dad was not a social drinker. He was not the kind of person that, that was the life of the party when you went over to his house. Uh, he, he, he started out that way, but he didn't end up that way. Uh, dad was a raging alcoholic. And he was an angry alcoholic. He was a mean alcoholic. And a lot of that anger that he took out, mom was the front line that kept us from getting it. And oftentimes, mama couldn't even stop him. See, that's the kind of mom I had. Even though not raised in a Christian home, my mom had a lot of the character traits of a Christian. You know? And so I look back at those pictures, and I'm reminded on this Mother's Day that, man, I, God got me to the point where I could be saved because of a mother who wasn't even a Christian herself and didn't even profess to be a Christian at that moment. But a good person was there, making an impact in our life. Um, the next picture I have is, is mom, me and mom together. And this was probably about 15 years ago, and, and she was just as happy as the Lord. She loved her, the fact that she had a son that was a preacher. Because guess what? Mom knew what it was like to get me out of jail. Mom knew what, what it was like to clean up the vomit beside my bed in the morning. Mom knew what it was like to take that old filthy clothes that I couldn't, I came in drunk and inebriated and, and take them and wash them when she should have burned them. Mom knew that. Mom knew what it was like to wait up every night while we were out and could not go to sleep till the last kid came home. And every child had to go through the same ritual. We had to sit on mama's bed and we had to look into her face. And she wanted us to see in the reflection in her face the shame of what we had been doing that night. You know, I look back at that and I think, man, all those years went by in a blur, right? And then later in life, looking at that picture, reminding myself that my mom became a follower of Christ shortly after I became a Christ follower, and Lori did. Mom had Boy, what the joy it came from having a Christian mom. Even as an adult, having a Christian mom, what a joy. That last picture I want you to look at, it was taken just a few months before her life ended. There, she's at Trinity Healthcare there in Columbus, Mississippi. And I'm telling you that every time she knew I was coming to Mississippi, she had had them push her out there on the atrium where she could sit on the drive under because she wanted to wait to see her son pull up. She couldn't breathe. She couldn't walk. But she wanted to see that boy come. You know, those are things that Mother's Day means to me. But when we think about mothers, mothers mattering, and understanding that our mothers should matter, the way we treat our mothers, the way we respect our mothers, the way even we forgive our mothers. It should matter. Because there are a lot of things that you can go through your life and you can hold a grudge. And I tell you, to be honest with you, I wasn't always cool with mom. I was angry with mom. I've, I was also many times very, very vindictive toward mom because she allowed us to live in a very toxic place. And I could not understand that until my daddy died. And my mother stayed with my dad through all of his horribleness and stayed with him all those 27 days of the hospital in July 27th of 1987 when my daddy died. And I saw the love that my mother had for my father. What a beautiful love, right? What a beautiful love. And yet I saw that. Mothers matter. Forgiveness matters. Respect matters. Honors matters when it comes to our mothers. So when we think about mothers and the fact that they matter, I want you to, to ponder with me today, Mary, the mother of Jesus. 
And to be honest with you, she is the very person that we oftentimes misunderstand completely because of the very fact that there's so many other things about Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's because of Roman Catholicism and, and the way they've embraced Mary and they've looked at Mary and, and, and they view Mary. We, on the other hand, as an evangelical church, we shy away from Mary for fear that we would be somebody that would be critical of a denomination. Please understand me. I am not anti-Catholic. I am not trying to beat an anti-Catholic drum today. What I am going to do is I want to tell you a couple of things about Mary. And one thing right out of the chute, one thing about Mary that is so misunderstood, and that is the fact that, that Mary has been referred to, and I saw the image when I was in Rome years ago and went to the Basilica, and there is the image of Jesus putting a crown on Mary, and in the inscription in Latin it says, Jesus is anointing Mary, the queen of heaven. The only problem is that's not in the Bible. There are other things about Mary that's not in the Bible. The fact that, that, that Mary, uh, uh, that we are to let Mary be the one that we talk to to get to Jesus. In fact, Roman Catholicism calls it redemptrix. They also call it remediator. It's a, that we understand that he becomes redemption, she becomes redemption and mediator. The only problem is not, those are not in the Bible. You know what Mary was? Mary was a real woman. She was a real woman. She was a real woman just like every other woman is a real woman. She was a young girl. She was a teenager when she gave birth to Christ. That's all she was. But she was chosen of God. So that makes it a little bit different. She was not the Immaculate Conception, which means that Mary was not born with a sin problem. So therefore, she had no sin. She was not a perpetual virgin. Mary had multiple children with Joseph. So she, she was a virgin when Jesus was born, but she did not stay a virgin. So a lot of things that we know about Mary, they come from other places other than the Word of God. What we do know about Mary is the fact that she was that real woman. She was a real, real woman. She was a young girl that gave birth to the Son of God. And a couple of things very quickly I want us to, to look at today. Number one is that she was a woman that had, I think, at age 14, maybe 15, she was unquestionably a young girl of character. I mean, character is a beautiful thing, right? Character is not the same as, as reputation. You know, a reputation about somebody can be started falsely about them. All it takes is one or two people to repeat it. And before you know it, that's the way their reputation is. Guess what Mary was? Mary was probably the one that was attacked and miscategorized all throughout her young adult life. Even after she gave birth to other children, people still looked down their nose in disdain at Mary. She was ridiculed. But yet, what you find about Mary, she was a woman that had impeccable character. What character did she have? Look at the scripture. It says that after Gabriel had made its way to Zechariah and told Elizabeth that she's going to have a baby, she's an old, wore out lady, and she's going to give birth, and Zechariah didn't believe it, and then Zechariah was stricken mute. He couldn't say anything. And lo and behold, John the Baptist was born unto Zechariah and Elizabeth. On the other extreme, the same Gabriel makes his way to that little hayseed little town called Nazareth. And just in case you're wondering, Nazareth in Jesus' day was only a couple hundred people at best. It was nothing. It was po dunk -ville. 
It was not that, that Nazareth put Jesus on the mount. Actually, it was that Jesus put Nazareth on the mount, right? That's how that happened. And the Bible says of all the places for Gabriel to go, I mean, he could have gone to the, to the cultural center of that day, Athens. He could have gone to the military center of that day, Rome. He could have gone to the religious center of that day, Jerusalem. But oh, no. He went to a little hazy town on the outskirts of nothing, to a nothing place. And there he found a young girl, 14, 15 at best. And this is what Scripture says. That Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin that was engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Everything that you need to know about Mary in the beginning of her life and her understa our understanding of her in the Bible, you find in Luke 1. You can find it in the Gospel of Matthew. You can also find it in the Gospel of John. You can also find it in the Gospel of Mark. But what you do find is this, is that this real woman lived in a real town and she had a real experience that she was going to get married. I mean, isn't that the dream of every 14 or 15-year-old girl to get married? I mean, don't they want to get married? You know, in my day, girls wanted to get married. In fact, Lori, my wife, uh, uh, she wanted to get married. The deal was that she had three things that she put in her diary. She said, I don't want to ever be married to a preacher. Mm -hmm. I don't want to ever have redheaded kids. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to live in Birmingham. Don't put stuff in your diary. Lori put that in her diary. And bingo! Redheads are everywhere, and we're close enough to Birmingham that you can smell it. And guess what? She didn't marry a preacher. She married a pagan. And God made him a preacher. See, that's what God does. That's what God did in Mary's life. The Bible says that, that, that here this woman was, that she was a spouse. She was betrothed. She had a year to work out whatever differences her and Joseph had before they had the hoopah, when, which means marriage, when they consummated their marriage. See, the betrothal period was a whole year. Man and woman didn't sleep together. They didn't cohabitate. They didn't test drive around the block for a whole year. No, 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 no. They, she stayed a virgin. She was a woman that held true to her morals. She held true to what she was taught. And that is character. That takes character to take that kind of stand. And in the midst of all of that, Gabriel comes. And in the midst of Gabriel coming and telling her that you are going to have a baby. And she said, how can it be? I don't know this man. I don't know a man. And that word no is the word sexual. It means I don't know relationally this man. See, that's character, isn't it? And then all of a sudden when you read the story of Mary's story in Luke 1, you find this unbelievable God love that she had in her heart for God. That she did as God had asked her to do. And friend, can I tell you, that's where character comes from. That's what character should look like in our life. Is that we find what God wants us to do, not what culture wants us to do, but what God wants us to do, and we pursue after that. And even if everybody stands against it, we still pursue God. Because that's where character is, right? Reputation is maybe what people think about you, but God, character is what God knows about you. God knows if your heart is His. God knows if your devotion is there for Him. God knows. And God knew that of all people, this little podunk, hay, hay seed little town outside of nowhere, Nowhereville, this little Nazareth girl, she was the girl. This is the kind of stock that is needed to give birth to the Son of God. What a beautiful picture 
of character. What a beautiful picture of what character should look like, even in the midst of ridicule, because you know, my goodness, she was ridiculed. In fact, when you read the narrative, you know that Joseph privately wanted to put her away and privately wanted to do things not to shame her because Joseph was a man of character too. Joseph knows that he had, knows that he hadn't been with her, and, and Mary knew that she hadn't been with Joseph, and she knew that she was pregnant by, by God or by the Holy Spirit of God. Joseph didn't. But Joseph, even though he had character, Mary had character. Not everybody in Nazareth had character. They came after her with everything they could throw at her. Friend, I'm going to tell you, you can be ridiculed all day long if you have character in your life. If you take a stand for God, you can walk through the valley of the shadow of death if you know that God's with you. Mary goes on to say that I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. I mean, isn't that submission? Isn't that what she's saying? May it be done to me according to the word that you've given me. See, that is a submission, submitted heart. Mary knew that she had not been with Joseph. And, and, and then Gabriel says, hey, it may be impossible with you, but it's not, nothing's impossible with God. So what was Mary? Mary was just being submissive. She said, I'll, I'll let, make me uh, uh, as one of the Lord's slaves. Now, I, I know that creates all kind of negative images in our mind. But in, even in the culture of Jesus' day, that slave, that young girl, she understood what it meant to be a, a bondservant of such. And actually, all of her life until Joseph came along, she was a bondservant to her father. Her father was the one who owned her life. Her father was the one that told her how how to jump and when to jump. It was her father that gave her marching orders. It was her daddy that held her best interests at heart. It was her daddy that helped find a suitor for her. It was her daddy that groomed out Joseph and made sure that Joseph would be the man. And then all of a sudden, when the patrol began, it was right there that she understood that I'm now giving myself over to Joseph. I'm going to be his bond servant. And now as a follower of God, because of the angel of the Lord, she, she turns right around and says, make me a slave. Know that I'm a slave. I will be submissive to you for the rest of my life. You know how it works. Everybody going through teenager or young post-puberty years, we can get real sensitive to God and fall in love with God during camp. And when school starts, God died. We're not submitted to him no more. I'm not obeying him because nobody else is obeying him. I'm going to do what I daggum well please. I don't care what anybody else says. Don't we, don't we see that every day? In, in our whole family line, we can look through our family line and see people that are, that are casualties to that way of thinking. But not Mary. Mary was submissive. You know, Mary's the only person in the Bible was, that was there, physical person that was there at the birth of Jesus and also at the death of Jesus. Mary was submissive. She was submissive all the way through. That's what we find in the life of Mary. A life of submissiveness. Someone said that, that when we think about our mothers, when we're four years of age, our, our thought system is that mom can do anything. At 12, mom doesn't know everything. At 14, 
Mom doesn't know anything. At 18, mom is completely out of step with time. At 25, mom knows a few things. At 35, before we decide, let's get mom's opinion. At 45, I wonder what mom would think about this. And at age 65, I wish I could talk to mom one more time. So what you find in the life of Mary, that she didn't age out of her love for God. She stayed submitted all the way through. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. There were some times that she got under her son's skin. If you read the Gospel of John, they were at a wedding feast at Canaan of Galilee, and the wine had run out, and there was Mary. She was trying to miss fix it, Mom. Hey, listen, don't worry. I got a kid. He's a good kid. He's the perfect kid. Actually, he's God's son, and he can make water into wine. You know the story, right? And there was the first miracle that was done. And it was at the bequest of Mary, the mother. And Jesus had to get on to his own mother. Mom, why are you doing this? I'm not even supposed to be known right now. But because you've already done it, Mom, I'm doing it. You see that right in Mary? Mary was a real mother, but she was not a perfect mother. I'm telling you, she beat the stuffings out of all them other siblings of Jesus. Never once had to touch Jesus. Never once had to spank him. Never once had to put his nose in a, in a circle and had him stand in the corner. Never once had to pull the whole spoon job on him. Never one time. But them other kids of hers and Joseph, she had to beat the stuffings out of them. Don't you know what that must have been like for Jesus to grow up in that environment where every one of your siblings have given the right opportunity? They would not just sell you into slavery like what happened to Joseph. They would kill you with a blunt instrument. Don't you know they felt that way? None of his siblings believed in him. They thought he was crazy. They thought he was a lunatic. And where was Mary? Mary was right there, submissive. Submissive to God the Father. That's what you find in the life of Mary. You find that Mary was a woman of dedication. I mean absolute dedication. When you look through her life, she's always there. She was there. She was there at the beginning. She was there when they went to the temple to, for the dedication. She was there when she heard the prophecy that your heart, ma'am, is going to be crushed because of the rising and the fall of this kid here. Everything about what you're holding is going to break your heart. And Mary kept all of those things to herself. And she pondered them throughout of her life. When Jesus was 12 years of age and they'd gone to the temple and they'd gone a day's journey and Jesus, Mary thought that Jesus was with Joseph and Joseph thought Jesus is with Mary and they came to the end of the day and they realized they didn't. Neither one of them had Jesus. They lost Jesus. And they went another day's journey back to Jerusalem and on the third day, what did they find? They found Jesus. 12 years of age, baby Baby Jesus, now 12. And there's Mary, brokenhearted, dedicated to search for the Son of God. And she found Jesus. Then you think about that dedication. The dedication when it comes at the end and during that video that we saw that there was an adoption that took place at the cross. When the beloved John was there and there was Mary, the mother of Jesus, witnessing the death of her son. And the scripture says that when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto the, his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith it to the disciples, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into, unto his own home. Years ago, I had the privilege of standing in Ephesus, what they believed to be John's home, which they also believed to be the very place that Mary died. And naturally, they built 
a ma- unbelievable building there just for the recognition that Mary lived and died right here in this little town of Ephesus. I don't know where she lived and died, but I do know this, that she was dedicated to the end of Jesus' life. And for everything that we know about history, about her life, and there's not a lot of stuff about Mary, the overwhelming knowledge we have is that she stayed dedicated to the end of hers. From that little girl in that windswept little town to that aged woman that not only outlived her husband, because Joseph was, was dead before Jesus died, outlived her son and possibly several of her other children. But she never, ever died on her love for God. Can I tell you, that's dedication, isn't it? That's being dedicated all the way to the end of your life, knowing that God and God alone If you're devoted and dedicated to him, he is more than sufficient. You know, I have one last picture, and I've shown this Mother's Day a long time ago. But this picture was taken on the second day of April, which was a Sunday. I preached here that morning. I got in my car, and I drove to Mississippi. Mom's at the hospital, not, in nursing home, not well at all. I go to spend some time with her. I pull my chair up beside her bed. Very few words are said. And then out of nowhere, she said, can I just put my foot on yours, son? So I had my foot up there, and I propped it up. And their mother, she just put her foot there, and, and she slipped off to sleep, skin to skin. I left that night on Sunday, and I came back home. On that Monday, I went back, and she started getting worse. Monday forever will be etched into my memory for the first knowledge I had of my entire life. It was on that Monday night that mother, I was sick. I had the fever or something, and mother tapped the bed and said, lay down beside your mother. No memory ever in my life of crawling up beside my mother in bed. Never. We just didn't do that. We were non-touchy. We grew up in a family where there was, was no caressing, no loving, no holding. None of that happened in our home. No, I love you, mother. Never. I became a Christian. The first words after my, out of my mouth, probably even one of the first words out of my mouth after I became a Christian was, I love you, Mom. I didn't know how to love her. And I don't think she really understood how to love, too, in the best way. But, boy, we figured it out. And that night I slipped up in that bed, and I slept beside my mother, burning up with fever. And I got up on Monday. I spent the night Monday night, got up at 4 o'clock, drove back home. Got me some clothes, and I drove back, and then she died that afternoon. When I look at that picture, I see the feet, a foot of a woman that had walked through many a trails in her life. Those were the very feet that carried her children. Those same feet were the same feet that she would run from her husband with. Those were the same feet that when she could not afford shoes for herself, she made sure that we had shoes for all five of them kids. My mom's foot is a reminder of all the many miles that she walked for her kids. Everything that she did without so that we could have. Reminds me of that night in that Baptist Mission tent on New Hope Road when Jesus Christ became more than just a name to mother. 
And she walked down that sawdust trail and she yielded her whole life to Jesus. Still married to an alcoholic. When I look at that picture, I think about all the sacrifices that she made for all of her children. So moms, ladies, guys, dads, you owe to your family character. You owe it to them. You, you owe determination in your life. You owe dedication. You owe them submissiveness. You, know, you need to be submissive to God. You need to live your life in such a way that you know that your witness will outlive your life. When I look at that picture, my mom's been gone four years and almost a couple of months. And I'm going to tell you, her impact in my life still is very valid to this very day. Because God did not waste his love on my mother. And my mother did not waste her life loving the things of this world more than loving her God. God, thank you for wonderful, wonderful role models that we have in our life. And for those that just happens to be mothers. Thank you for those that, of us who have mothers that we can go to today. Thank you, God, for, for mother-in-laws. Thank you, Father, for Carolyn and the mother-in-law that she was. And even... In my mother and mother-in-law's life, they were real people, Father. They did not live in some altered state. I'm thankful, God, for the mother of my children. I'm thankful, God, for my grandchildren's mother. I'm thankful, Father God, that in this room today, there are so many other people that have spoken into our life and encouraged us. And today, Father, we need to give them the respect that is due them, not just today, but every day. Over these last few weeks, church, we've talked about how the faith matters. We, we talked about trusting God with all your heart, leaning not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledging him. That matters to God. We talked about time, that this time, this life will go quick. I'm going to be truthful. I can't believe how quick it's gone. But what we do for you in this moment is going to be something, God, that's going to outlast our physical body. When we trust you, when we give our life to you, when we submit ourselves to you and devote ourselves to you, we're simply acknowledging, God, that, that my best is not enough, but your goodness and grace is and I'm giving you my life, my failures, my disappointments, my mistakes. I'm giving it all to you today, Jesus. So on this Mother's Day of 2021, God, would you do something in me that would cause me to be faithful all the way to the end? Help me not to be distracted by this world or the things in this world. But help me to be devoted to you, Jesus. If 
that's your prayer today, won't you settle that in your heart and say, this is it, God. My life is yours. From this moment on, it's yours. And I want to follow you. Whatever it looks like, I want to follow you until you call me home. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Goodness of God.